Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, good morning, or I guess good afternoon uh, to folks. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second and last installment of our conversations on Ejiga Shuwing Deniwan uh, speaker series. My name is Missy LeBlanc, and I am the curatorial resident for Truck Contemporary Art, as well as the co curator for Mamano Pikasquewina. Mother Tongue's Dish with One Spoon territory. Mamano Pegasuiwina is presented in concert with the touring exhibition, uh, Tasquits Pipa Konaka Nipa Muskosia Nipin Pisim Pima uh, Eti uh, Pimachihiu, uh, Like the Winter Snow Kills the Grass, the Summer Sun Revives It, uh, which is curated by myself and organized and circulated by Truck Contemporary Art and is currently on view at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa, Ontario. The exhibition celebrates and centers Indigenous language revitalization and ways of knowing and aims to address and initiate a discussion on how the dormancy and extinction of Indigenous languages leads to a hindrance of culture and knowledge. Pipankona and the Pinpasim brings together emerging and established Indigenous artists based in so-called Canada to give space back to those artists whose practices deal with Indigenous languages in each of their visibilities, vulnerabilities, and regional voices. As Pipon Kona and Nipin Basim moves across this landmass, Mamano Pekasquiwina has been adapted to act as a framework of engagement for right relations to the localities of each of the tour locations. Each of the host organizations will curate and present their own iteration of Mamano Pekasquiwina to develop and develop programming that engages with the local Indigenous communities uh, and their language revitalization efforts. The hope with this programming is that the engagement will spark long term institutional change with the host organization by supporting Indigenous cultural workers and artists, as well as building a dialogical, reciprocal, and sustainable relationship with the Indigenous community at large while taking into account the specificity of the language traditions of the land. The Oshawa iteration of this pop project, Mamano Pikasquewina, Mother Tongue's Dish with One Spoon Territory, was co-curated by myself and Aaron Sikora and developed in consultation with local artists, elders, language teachers, and community organizers from across the Durham region and beyond. I am very excited today to introduce you to our panelists, uh, some of which were part of the consultations that Erin led this summer. Before I go ahead and do that, I want to first acknowledge that the Robert McLaughlin Gallery uh, is located on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. Uh, this land has been the traditional territory of the Michisagig Nishnabeg since, since 1700, before which it was stewarded by various communities belonging to the Haudenosaunee and Wendat Confederacies. This land presently covered under the Williams Treaties and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement and continues to be home to many Indigenous people from across Canada today. I also want to recognize that I am currently zooming in from Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory, the original lands and waters of the Anishinaabe, and Inuyawak, Anishinaabeg, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and which is on the homeland of the Métis Nation. I would also like to acknowledge the digital territory we are all joining in from today. As we continue our conversation, uh, you will notice on the bottom of your screen there is a chat box as well as a Q&A box. Um, feel free to go ahead and enter, enter in any sort of questions, or if you even just want to let us know where you're joining in from us today, that would be more than welcome. Uh, finally, I would like to thank our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts and the Ontario Trillium Foundation for the support of this project. I would also like to thank Aaron Zakora and Leela Timmons and everyone else at the RMG for respecting and taking care of this exhibition and its intentions and for all of your support throughout this. It was really, it has been such an amazing and lovely time working with all of you, even though we've been in a pandemic and that's been hard sometimes, um, but it's been such a great uh, time spending with you folks. Um, before we begin, again, please note the Q&A and chat box features at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any questions for our speakers today, please type them into either of those boxes. Um, 
If you also are having any sort of technical issues with this webinar, please also let us know by chatting into the chat, chat box because one of the, uh, if that happens, one of the RNG staff will be happy to help you out. Uh, the way this event will be structured is that I will first, first introduce our speakers and allow them to tell us a bit more about themselves um, as well as give some mini presentations which will be then followed by a few questions uh, that I prepared, but also any questions that come up throughout the chat um, from the audience. Uh, so, uh, do, 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 do. and with that, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Eldi, Elder Shirley Williams, who graciously provided the translations for the curatorial text, along with Isidore Toulouse. Shirley? Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, Shirley is a member of the Bird Clan of the Ojibwe and Odawa First Nations of Canada. Her Anishinaabe name is Migitsi Okwe, meaning Eagle Woman. She was born and raised in Wikwi Migong, Manitoulin Island, and attended St. Joseph's Residential School in Spanish Ontario. After completing her Native Studies diploma, she received her Bachelor of Arts in Native Studies at Trent University and her Native Language Instructors Program Diploma from Lakehood University in Thunder Bay. Shirley received her master's degree from York University in Environmental Studies in June 2004. Uh, in, June. in June 2004, Shirley retired, Shirley retired from the Indigenous Studies Department and now holds the title Professor Emeritus. Shirley received an honorary doctorate from the University of Ontario Institute of Technology in, in 2017 for her outstanding achievement in post-secondary education pedagogy, her advocacy of Indigenous language teaching, and her ongoing inspirational community leadership. Shirley, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit more about yourself, something that I missed in the bio. I know you have a few notes and a bit of a presentation prepared. Yeah, no, uh, I think you covered pretty well everything. I don't need to add. Just um, it'll take about two days to talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just uh, I'm just glad to be here, and thank you for pronouncing everything in the Shnabaman correctly. Yeah, that was my biggest worry there. If I was uh, actually pronouncing things correctly, I took a look at a pronunciation guide just to make sure. So I, I'm glad I got those. Yeah, you did. So I have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, if you can put it on now, and I'll just say next whenever you turn the slide over. Yep. <clears throat> I did this uh, Anishinaabe words for, for the earth, uh, and I just uh, increased it more for the AGO in Toronto, uh, for Wanda um, Nanabush. And since then, I've been asked to translate a lot of the words for different uh, art galleries, such as the one here, Robert McLaughlin, York University, uh, the other one, I forgot the name of it, that's uh, across from the uh, uh, King's, uh, King's Way, uh, <clears throat> across, you know, where the, the slides and things like that are. Uh, I was there when they did the display for residential schools. So, and one in, in Ottawa also. I didn't do any work, but they uh, invited me to see the film of where are the children in a residential school in which I was nominated to be a role model for the residential school. So anyway, so here we go. Number one slide. These are, I talked about our tools to help to do something. These are modern tools that we use, but uh, they're combined with uh, the tools, the dyes that we use in order to color, um, you know, we use, the earth, we use the leaves, we use uh, orca uh, in order to use certain dyes, you know, to dye porcupine quills and things like that. So we do have our tools also, but only from the land. Next one. Many have these gifts to create images. We all have a different uh, skills and talents and so we carry these images. We are gifted with these eyes and vision 
for creation techniques and that. So oftentimes there are elders tell us that use your creation. It's in your it's in your heart. It's in your mind. It's in your heart. Also, next one. The sound way words for art. An an example would be mizin bigewin is a word we use for art. Uh, it means the uh, uh, the art of doing the artwork. It's a, it also means a fancy drawing of something. Okay, next one. And the fancy art, uh, the colors that we use, it just shows you. I just picked this up from the uh, Facebook. I uh, thought it was really nice because one of the things that uh, we use is the circle in, in our many thoughts and artwork. Next one. Zinbige asin is another word, nibishan, nibishan, which means that the, the wind is making the leaves fancy in the wind. So the picture shows us what it's doing. It's a picture from Manny Taylor. Manny Taylor is from Curve Lake. And uh, she sent me this. And so I kept it. But it shows when the air blows or when the wind blows up in the up on the land, you see all kinds of leaves, you know, moving. So that's the word that we're describing on there. Next one. Zinbigas and Nippe is another one. Uh, the wind is making fancy swirling waters. So we have for Zinbigas and the picture, please. So you can see that the, uh, the water, and we call this in our language uh, that the water is kind of angry, but it it makes fancy things with that water. So you could see it's splashing and it makes noise. Next one. Tisige is to color something. It means he or she is coloring something like a coloring book. It can also mean that he or she is coloring their hair also. So it means two things. So you have to watch what you are what you are doing. Oh, my picture went out. <clears throat> anyway, you still can hear me, right? Uh, yes, we can hear you, Shirley. Um, there, you may have accidentally pressed your stop video button, which is in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Um, but it's okay, you can continue without your video as well. How do I get back on? Um, we can still hear you, Shirley. Um, potentially, do you want to double check in the bottom left hand corner of your screen? There might be a uh, the button that says start video. Double check if there's a red slash through it. And if there is, uh, go ahead and press that. Otherwise, um, the video stopping would be on your end and might be a computer issue. But we can still hear you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and continue so to eliminate the time. Okay. But I don't see the pictures though. Okay. Uh, Shirley? Yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead and speak. Uh, continue okay. on with your presentation. Are you able to see the presentation? No, I can't see the presentation. You can't see the presentation. Um, that is a great question. Erin, I know you can hear us. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for Sir Shirley. Hi, Shirley. I'm just going to try to make it so you can share your screen again. One second. OK, there might be a. Okay. Okay, it we're on. It's on. It's on. Okay. Can you see the screen, Shirley? Yes, I can see the screen. Okay, I'm back on. <laughs> okay, so I don't touch nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep my hands behind my back. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the word here, Msin Sin, is Sit Negwe King. It means that the, uh, the foot is printed on the, um, on the earth or on the hand. So paintings, we do have sand paintings in the sand for sometimes for teachings in the Middle and Lodge. It is also done in the, on the sand 
It's usually done in the evening and rub off before the sun comes up again. Uh, that is to uh, not to leave any negativeness that, that was around. So we erase that after we do it on, on the sand and we talk about, uh, you know, the creation story, how it got evolved from that. So we use the sand teachings. So I think I have the picture showing about that. Yeah, see the foot there and then the finger. These uh, are seen at the petroglyphs here in Peterborough. If you ever go there, you can see some of it's the artwork that the shamans, um, or we call them spiritual leaders, when they see, when they saw a vision, they use chisels in order to mark out as to what they saw. Next one. Petroglyphs, Msinsing, Msinsia, Sinning stone that has a painting, uh, printing by stone, sometimes known as Kinomage wa apkung, uh, which is called teaching rocks. They use chisels of some stone to do the carving of what they saw in their vision quests or in their dreams and that. Next one. And here it shows many of the uh, articles that you can see on the petroglyphs. You can see the, the one in a circle on top of the head of the person, which we think that it's Nanabush. Uh, Nanabush is the first man that um, that walked this land. The turtle, which means a turtle island, and the Wapus is the, uh, the friend of Nanabush. And of course, the crane. There are a lot of crane teachers here. Next one. In this picture are man spirit, turtle, Nanabush, and crane. Next one. Now we go to a little bit of the indigenous art. This is a stone um, that's around here. And I've seen this in many places. Sometimes uh, people that, that belong to the, to the uh, clan, they will have a stone uh, and somebody that painted it. This one is a loon because loon is very important in our culture. I you can see that the necklace on the, on the neck uh, that's uh, shown the spirit's necklace. Uh, pictographs, Msin Sin, Anishinaabe used to um, uh, echo um, orca, earth to use as a yellow and brown uh, pigment, a paint to print um, something on the rocks. So you can see that from Wawa, Wanako Park, and many other places. Next one. So you, this is orca or red orca that was being used in order to right images as to what they saw in their vision. Next one. House painting, when we call that. They are the painting the house. And I have a picture to show with that. So here, um, we're more modernized now so that they can paint. And there's certain ways that uh, people who paint know how to, do, how to do that. And this way, and uh, you know, there's a special technique in order to do that. Next one. It's a picture of um, Msin Chicken. I call this Msin Chicken. I was asked to go and do a horse uh, ceremony. And this is a horse uh, that's uh, smelling my arm <laughs> or it's licking my arm. <laughs> okay, just to show a picture. This is a reflection of trees on the water. Msin Chiwad, Mtikong Nabing. Uh, this is uh, when I took a picture. Uh, when I started writing the books and things like that, I wrote, I saw a picture about an eagle. I thought, oh, what a good way. I could uh, describe what I see here as part of teaching, you know, different words on the language and things like that. Well, you know, when I wrote to them and asked for permission, if I could use it, they want $5,000 for it. So I thought, there's no way I'm going to pay $5,000. I'm going to go and learn. I'm going to go and take photography. So I did a photography course at Search Art for Fleming College. And I took pictures. And uh, what I was asked to do uh, was about water, to take pictures of the water. And this is one picture that I took of myself. Um, it is in the fall. How the reflection is on the water when the water is still. Next one. 
The art of photography and coffee, photocopying. The photocopy is something it can also mean to copy something like typing. As the letters come up, it is fancy. Like when you're typing, it comes up and you see it. Okay, I think I have uh, three more minutes. Next one. To make a mark, a Beshakabigan, we call this Beshakabigan, which is mean this way, or sometimes Beshakabigan, to make a cross, you know, when you're folding in that. So it's the art of uh, making a mark, to vote or to make a mark on something. Next one. And this is another picture of the leaves with the wind that's blowing. When the wind blows uh, something, it makes all kinds of images. Wind making a fancy mark, the wind is making a leaf fly fancy in the air. Next one. Wood carving, wood uh, carving, there are special people that have really good talents on the, making uh, wood carvings like this one here. Uh, this is a total pole from the East Coast, but we also have them here and here in Ojibwe still have a lot of things too. They make wood carvings, some many, many different things. Next one. Fancy clouds, msinakot, fancy clouds. Next picture. You can see that uh, <clears throat> there's uh, almost watered uh, pulling up to the um, to the clouds, and we call this in our language, uh, the clouds are drinking the water. Next one. Uh, in conclusion, the words we use is to re research to describe the words for, for example, glue, the tree, uh, gun traditionally was used as part of glue, and, uh, and gluing the canoe or gluing something. Um, gelatin from milk that was used harder, uh, like a paste. It's like that. Uh, and the same thing with the gum we take from off the trees. We we uh, melt that and it becomes gluey to to glue something. Uh, images like uh, silhouettes. Uh, we used to have fun when it came dark. We used to uh, use coal oil as, as children. Uh, in our room to make light. So we could make images using the silhouettes. And we would, that's because there was nine children in us, and we would make a competition. So we would make horses, wabus, uh, rabbits, and things like that. Well, we had all kinds of, we had entertainment before we went to bed. And if we laughed too much, they say, how are you gonna work tomorrow? You won't be able to think, it's bedtime now. So we're chased to go to bed. <laughs> so um, the next one, I think, if there's any more. Oh, Agio translations, these are and I did. Uh, when I first, uh, we never had the um, uh, writing system. Uh, our language was, uh, orally done. So we never had to do any writing, but it, it had to be in 1974, uh, we began to uh, do the writing, but we adopted the decision writing, which is phonetic way of writing, but it wasn't very consistent. So in 1986, there was a linguist that came and that gave us um, more of, uh, methods on how to, how to write. And that took off when we call it uh, the double vowel writing system. That's the one we use today. So when I started writing uh, about the language, uh, what I encountered was uh, I went to many of the publishers and the publishers said, um, we don't publish language books because there's no money in it. And so uh, I had to, I went to my elders and the elders said, why don't you be a self-publisher? You can publish your own work. So that's to this day, that's what I have done. Uh, they, the view was that the language was not very important and that only English and uh, English and French were the, the main official languages here in Canada. 
would uh, remember Aboriginal people who were here and they had their own language, um, which was ignored, totally ignored. Um, it's only, only, it's now becoming important and in Canada, but it hasn't been officially taken, but in Canada, there should be three official languages, which is uh, English, French, and Ojibwe, or any of the tribal languages here in Canada. So our, our, um, our idea, their, their ideas was that uh, our languages, their books were not very economical. Uh, uh, there was no support for funding for languages either. So those are the things that we encountered. So miigwech for listening to me, miigwech pamapi. Thank you so much, Shirley, for that presentation. Um, I was definitely taking notes throughout it and for sharing us all those Anishinaabe Moet words as they relate to art. So thank you so much for that. Um, so for our next present next panelist, we have Lacey Burney. Lacey is a Ghanaian Gehaka, multidisciplinary artist and curator base uh, raised on Six Nations of the Grand River located in Southern Ontario. They work in photography, video, installation and sculpture and graduated in 2019 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Emily Carr University of Art and Design with a focus on in Indigenous art and they are currently pursuing their MFA at OCAD University. Having come from a culturally and politically grounded upbringing, their work focuses on politics of indigeneity and identity from a Haudenosaunee perspective. Lacey, did you put that you there? Yeah, I know you have a few talking points uh, for us as well as some photo, a few photo or a photo that you'd like to share with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Adelono Genagale Dahno Six Nations Nino Ageno. Um yeah, Ganyakahaga Wagenyato. Um I don't usually share the meaning of my Mohawk name, but because of Shirley's presentation, um, it means that I changed the color of the leaves. Um I got it from Degalundage, uh Paul Delarond from Gahnawage. Um, because some of us have names that were not passed down through the longhouse. So some people like have to make them up. Uh, so like, I'm really grateful that I have that name. And yeah, I have it because I was born in the fall and you know, leaves change. <laughs> so um, yeah, <clears throat> I started learning Mohawk in kindergarten. I was um, in a immersion program at Oliver M. Smith Gowan EO School on Six Nations. And it was taught by my great aunt, Ogolaf Goha. And she uh, was one of the people in the community that wanted to focus on teaching children the language. Um, and after that kindergarten program, they didn't have full immersion Mohawk anymore. Uh, I think anywhere um, outside of Gowan EO School, I think in Six Nations. Um, and then I was at Jameson School for three years where I learned a bit of Kyuga. And then I went back to Oliver M. Smith and I was in the 50-50 uh, Mohawk immersion program. So it meant that like half of the day you are fully like immersed in Mohawk until my great aunt Uncle Loft um, passed away. I was taught by her. Um, so in grade four, she passed away. Um, and then I was taught by Dejo Dagalado, um, Jeremy Green. Uh, he came from Titanega and he was, uh, we basically got to the point where we were almost able to become fluent. So we we're putting together sentences, being able to figure out like the structure of the language. Um, then after that uh, program, there was kind of like, it was like starting from scratch all the time. Um, so that's kind of where I come from in my Mohawk learning, our Ginyakeha. Um, and I've been in Vancouver for 10 years, so it's been hard to uh, get back into that. And I was going to share an image. Um, ooh, I don't see the share. 
button. Oh, wait, there it is. So yeah, I just wanted to share this photo that I did. Um, it was right before the pandemic began that I kind of had this idea because um, there were all the um, occupations happening in Vancouver where um, I think the one that I was at was at um, Granville and Broadway. And we stayed the night and I was laying on the cement just staring at the sky. <clears throat> and um, I had this moment where like, okay, so my friend gave me this big wool blanket and um, I was just watching the stars and in Mohawk culture or like as Turtle Clan people, I'm Turtle Clan, um, they say we're the stars. So like we come from star people and I was just looking at them and I was like, well, they're watching out for us down here and I'm watching them. And uh, yeah, it was just like a nice moment of like understanding my place and like understanding why I'm here and like, yeah, and what we're doing as like land defenders and people occupying space. So that's why she's on the cement. And yeah, um, it's called Ada and it's actually the root word of uh, Mohawk. So like, um, I know some people can be pretty rigid about, um, I guess putting language out there or like talking about language because it is like really complex and I'm kind of sharing it that way because I want to not be um, sure that we don't have to be judgmental about our place and where we're at with our language understanding, because also like um, a language person will understand that that's the root word as well. And um, also like, it has an artistic context where it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific word about a thing. You know, you can kind of be like, oh yeah, rising. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. But that's where, yeah, I'm, that's where I'm at. And I wanted to acknowledge that place, I suppose. Um, and it is, yeah, it is really complex. And I've been happy to be in my territory, finally. So yeah, I just moved back in October. And yeah, there's lots of programs. And I've just been learning at home on my own, like reading old books and stuff, you know, get, get, like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just having fun. Uh, and like, yeah, that's one of the things that I wanted to think about, I guess, through my practice too, is that, yeah, acknowledging everyone's place and like learning and yeah, you know. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Lacey. It was really, yeah, lovely to hear you speak. Um, a quick question in the chat before we go forward. Uh, Jennifer was asking if the photo that you shared was taken at night. Um, or if that was done during the day. No, it was done during the day, like not during the protests as well. It was really hard because I had to be really high up. <laughs> no, I can I can definitely imagine that. Okay. So lastly, I would like to introduce uh, Sarah McLeod Beaver. Uh, Sarah is an Anishinaabe Lowen language teacher from Alderville uh, First Nation. Uh, she currently resides in Lakefield, Ontario with her husband and two daughters. Uh, Sarah facilitates a weekly family language program through the First Peoples Indigenous Centre at Durham College in Oshawa. Uh, in the past, she has taught Anishinaabe Lowen as a second language in the provincial and First Nation school systems. 
Uh, Sarah is a lifelong learner of Anishinaabe Moen who has developed her fluency through immersion learning and mentorship programs. She believes strongly that anyone can learn the language and advocates for community spaces where people can speak Anishinaabe Moen to one another. Uh, Sarah, thanks for joining us today. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and kind of your relationship with language and any other kind of talking points that you have prepared? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Miigwech, for having me here. And uh, Miigwech to Shirley and Lacey for sharing your stories. I really enjoyed listening to them. And uh, I guess a lot of commonalities too in our, our stories. Um, so yeah, there's really not much more about my background, I can say, um, apart from uh, what Missy shared there. Um, but uh, kind of like Lacey, um, my first, my first connection to Anishina Bemwin um, was at an early age, but it was through school um, rather than in the home. Uh, I grew up in Alderville, First Nation, and um, nobody in my family uh, or community spoke Anishina Bemwin fluently. So uh, it was the second language that I took in elementary school. And uh, all of the uh, language teachers that I had in elementary school came from outside of my community. So uh, mostly from Curve Lake First Nation, which is actually close to, it's about an hour and 15 minutes away from Alderville and just 20 minutes away from where I live right now. So it's very close by. Um, and we also had uh, some language teachers from Wequemekong as well. And uh, I, I love, I've always loved learning Nishinaabem when it was my favorite class in school. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I just, I enjoyed learning about the culture. Um, I love learning all the words. Uh, and because it was mainly just um, students from Alderville that took the Nishina Bemlin class at school and we're all related in Alderville. So um, I was basically in this little class with all my cousins. <laughs> and so it was just a nice time during the day where we just had our own little time together and uh and my language teachers were always like so different from my regular classroom teachers like in a good way you know and uh sometimes a little bit out there sometimes funny you know they share funny stories and they would know how to laugh around joke around and tease us so I don't know it was just a, a really nice time but uh yeah, um, but at the same time, um, my mom, I mean, Alderville is my mother's community. My, my dad is non-native. Um, uh, so my mom was kind of going through her own like cultural re reclamation, I guess. Uh, she was learning um, her teachings and, you know, I was involved in that with her and my community was kind of bringing back culture at that time. This was in the nineties when I went, when I was that age. Uh, going to elementary school. So we started having powwows, um, more powwows in the community uh, and certain ceremonies. And so I was able to take part in that at an early age. And that was my other connection to the language because I learned how to sing um, songs in Anishinaabemwin. I learned, like that's where I learned women's hand drum singing. And uh, I learned how to pray a bit in Anishinaabemwin. And so those experiences kind of laid the foundation for the, the rest of my language learning um, as an adult. Uh, I kind of gone in different directions with my career and, you know, with my family and, you know, lots of stuff has happened. Um, but, you know, throughout all of that, I've always maintained a, a connection to, to learning Anishinaabemwin. And um, yeah. And you know it it is important. Like I, the reason why I think why I, I've I've stayed with it for for so long um, is just you know it, it is a language that's it not I don't want to say it's in decline. Like I don't want to paint like a, a dim picture or anything. Um, but there's always that threat that we're going to lose it because most of the fluent speakers of Anishinaabemwin, especially in this area where I live, like in Southern Ontario, um, you know, they're all part of an older generation. And when I mean fluent, I mean, that was their first language growing up. It was the first language that they learned and they, you know, learned to speak that before uh, speaking English or, 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 you know, whatever other 
language. And, you know, so we don't have, you know, anybody in my community and in a lot of communities in this area um, that are part of that, like middle age adult or young adult or teen or, you know, youth age group that can speak Nishinaabemun fluently or not very many anyway. So there's always that threat of, you know, of it being in decline. And so that's, that's one of the main reasons why I've, I've stayed um, with language learning for, for so long. And uh, it's also, uh, it's, it, it's, it is important. I often revisit these two memories when I, like when it, because it is, it's, it's, hard to stay with it. Like, I don't know if Lacey can identify at all with this, but like, you know, trying to, to keep up with it and stay on top of your learning. Um, it, it is really hard, but I have these two memories that uh, usually keep me going. So uh, my grandmother, I called her Nana. She's my, was my mom's mother. Uh, she, when I was uh, a teenager, she was telling, um, myself and my sister and, and my mom and my aunt about uh, a dream that she had and uh, she said in her dream that there was elders and they were speaking Nishinaabemwin and she was just so happy about this dream she's like I could understand everything that they said and I was talking back to them in Nishinaabemwin and uh, yeah, it was great. Anyway, we all kind of laughed at her because uh, she doesn't, she didn't speak Nishan Ben when um, that wasn't her language growing up. Um, and she laughed too. She thought it was funny. We all kind of had a, a little chuckle over it. Um, but I thought to myself, you know, later, I was like, oh, she must have wanted to learn so badly that she just dreamed it. <laughs> and uh, and she, uh, she ended up passing away about 10, oh, yeah, over 10 years ago, about 12 years ago now. And uh, when my my mom and my aunt uh, were going through, you know, her things in her room, they found her uh, uh, 24 hours a day book, which was like her AA Bible. And, uh, and tucked in there was a little piece of paper and she had written the numbers one to 10 in Nishinaabemwin and kept it in there. And uh, her sobriety was really, really important to her. I think she had been sober for oh, like almost 40 years, you know, at the time when she passed away. Uh, and so she would have read that book every day and she would have seen that little piece of paper. And uh, yeah, it was just one more thing that, you know, made me realize how important uh, the language was to her. And, uh, and yeah, so it's just something that has always been taught to me or shown to me or modeled to me from a young age that, you know, it's, it's important to, to learn your language, your Indigenous language, Anishinaabemwin in particular, you know, for me, in my case, um, it has value, it's worth saving. And, you know, so that's why I, I continue to find ways to, to learn and to share what I learn with others, which is what I do through uh, the, the family language program at, uh, at Durham College. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Shirley, um, and those stories about your family and kind of the language path of your life. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so now we have moved on to kind of just the open-ended conversation portion of our webinar. Um, so for those folks in the audience, if you have any questions, again, feel free to pop them into the chat or the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, and we'll just kind of ask them as they come up. I don't want this to be kind of super formal, a little bit more chill and relaxed. Um, so the first question that I do have is uh, for Shirley and Sarah. Uh, so the two of you were involved in earlier parts of this project. Uh, Shirley, you provided the translations of the curatorial text along with Isidore Toulouse. And then Sarah, you were a part of the community consultations and conversations that Erin conducted this summer. I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on what it was like to work on this project for you or to be involved. Uh, well, for me, uh, when I'm asked to 
uh, to participate in the language and de language development or whatever kind of language. I'm always, always pleased to, to help in any way that I can. Uh, <clears throat> so in this way, when I was asked to participate with the, uh, the development of the project here, it was a pleasure. And sometimes I don't know all of, well, let me go back. I didn't speak any English at all. I was born fluently. I didn't speak English until I was 10. Uh, the only English sentence that I knew was, blessed art thou, which was a uh, Christian when we went to church, because that's what they used to say. So that's the only English sentence that I learned before going into residential school. And when I, I was the age of 10, when uh, my father finally uh, let me go, uh, he, they were coming to get me when I was at the age of seven. And my father said, no. And he said, I want one of my daughters to know the language and culture. All my children are coming back. They don't want to speak the language and they want to want to do the culture part. Therefore, I want one of my daughters to know <clears throat> the language and culture. So he kept me until the age of 10. There was nothing that the priest or the Indian agent could do because, um, you know, he insisted and there was no law or anything. Well, there was a law that if you did not let your children go to residential school, they would be jailed for six months out of two a year. <clears throat> but uh, what he promised them was he said he would homeschool me, but he didn't tell them in what language. So he homeschooled me all in the language until the age of 10. So I went into the residential school um, at the age of 10. And because we were isolated and we were forbidden to speak our language and to talk about our culture, uh, <clears throat> within three months, I was able to speak in English. So I'm thinking the same way. If we could teach our children, uh, isolate them, and it's like an immersion uh, place where they could learn to, to hear the language, listen to language, and speak the language. Um, I think we would be far ahead of time. Right now, they're only getting the language in school 50 minutes, and that's all a little bit of outside or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> and a, a lot of teachers and people are saying, uh, you know, all we're learning is uh, just words like nouns and that, but they, they're not learning how to uh, conjugate the uh, sentences, how they belong, just what he talked about. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we, have, we have to find a new methodology how we should teach the, the language. So for me, it was a joy and to help out as much as I can uh, with the project that was done. Thank you for that, Shirley. Thanks for sharing. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to uh, say? Um, uh, just that it was a it was a pleasure to be approached about the project and to have an opportunity to learn about it. Um, it was nice to see uh, that there was an interest in local language revitalization efforts in this area. Um, outside of language or education spheres. So coming from the art world, it was it was nice um, to see that because I think um, we need that recognition um, to broaden exposure to to language and efforts to revitalize it, you know, in lots of different spaces in our communities, not just in schools, not just in the home, um, but you know, in, in other public spaces. So and I think art, you know, is a it's a really nice way to do that. So yeah, it's just been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you. It's been really, I went through all the notes from Erin's uh, conversation she had this summer and was reading the notes that she had with your conversation and it was really, really lovely and really interesting to kind of hear the words or read the words uh, from, you know, a, a language teacher that's doing this kind of everyday kind of thing. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, my next question is for Lacey. Um, as a visual artist, your practice is centered on the politics of indigeneity and identity, and specifically from your own personal perspective. 
Um, although you don't make work that is specifically about your ancestral language, there are times that I've noticed where it's included in the title of your works. I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on how you incorporate uh, Ghanaian Gaha into your practice and what it means to what it means to you to include your ancestral language. Uh, yeah, I guess um, <clears throat> like I was talking about with my photograph, how it's like more of a subtle gesture towards how I kind of understand my culture and like how I grew up because um, a lot of times like you're so enmeshed in it that you don't even think about how when you're making something that like the relationship with the land is so like embedded with how you see it as like a Haudenosaunee person that it just makes sense to like you know take some pictures in the trees you know that sort of thing or like have this yeah and I was talking to a friend the other day and we we're kind of talking about how like um like the language you have to conjugate all these words and like it's so like particular in which way you put them together that it changes so much that kind of that's how I feel like I've been approaching visual art too because there's so many disparate things that you can put together that kind of don't make sense but if you put them together in a certain way then they make more sense and that's kind of how I've been trying to think about it more and also like when I think about language one of the reasons I want to learn is because there's so much in there like um, that yeah it's more like I've been told a lot that it's a, more of a philosophical language where it's like an squala doesn't just mean chair it kind of means like something that you sit on you know it's more of a description as opposed to and there's specificity to it than English is chair, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. there's lots of stuff like that where I'm like, you know, that better understanding is something that I'm kind of working towards. And I think, I don't know, it's just embedded in how I see the world. And like, I don't understand, but I want to understand because I've already been there, you know? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. I think that's really a really interesting idea you have there about like, or point that you made about conjugating words and kind of relating that to kind of like an art practice and these disparate parts coming together to kind of be one and have a new meaning. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so my next question is for everybody. Um, so as I'm sure we all know as, you know, Indigenous people that, you know, language dormancy and extinction can be tough and triggering topic for a lot of Indigenous people, especially because of, you know, the residential school system as like Shirley brought up um, and the 60 scoop and just being dis and dispossession from our lands. Um, I'm wondering where you how each of you kind of find healing or joy within this work of either learning your like the lifelong journey of learning your language or teaching others to learn the language who wants to go first <laughs> uh okay i'll, I'll go first then <clears throat> uh, i we have a language conference every year which we started in 1994. Um, going to Lakehead to go and learn orthography, we got together as fluent speakers to know what is it that we can do to turn this negative image or the negative um, words that our young people have towards our language? What can we do? How can we, how can we turn that around? So we said as fluent speakers that each of us are gonna go back home and do research with our elders and ask them. So what in my community, I went to my community and I asked the elders. And so the elders said, have you asked your, your children or the students as to what they would like to learn? Because what, we're hearing, what we were hearing is, I don't wanna learn another language. So I'm black and white. It's uh, shameful. And uh, I'm too ashamed to learn it or to even to take it. 
uh, this is what we're hearing. So we wanted to turn that around. What's the beauty of learning the language? So <clears throat> uh, for, for me, uh, I went to um, the students and so to uh, Pontiac School in Wiki, and I went to three different classes and I asked the same question is, why would you learn the language if there was a language put here? You know, can you tell me? So in the third class that I was there, there was a young little boy that was there and he kept on putting this, this, you know, to answer. So I thought, well, you must have something. So I asked him, I said, yes, tell me, why would you want to learn lang language or what kind of language would you like to, to learn if it was offered to you? So he says, I would like to learn about hockey. I'm in a hockey team and we're always losing. But if we learn hockey words, maybe we'll win. Oh, I, th I thought that was a good answer. Even though when we talked about curriculum, sports was not academically. It was not uh, seen as academic. So I thought it is academic. We have words to describe what we do in sports. Uh, it took me about three months. I was watching uh, APTN. And in the APTN is uh, Northern News, and they were having a hockey tournament. And they had OG Cree that was uh, commentating. And the OG Cree, I was listening because I want to learn, you know, how they uh, MC the hockey tournament. So this teacher was uh, uh, commentating, and he talked about this guy. His name was Chichu also. And he says, Oh, what did you wish? Oh, the kid is right one cornering this uh, puck because uh, they didn't have the word for puck. Well, I started to laugh, you know, because um, corner is in English, in to make it this locative. So cornering in, in the corner is what he was saying. I started to laugh. That would be fun to do, I thought. So I, there was no money. I tried to ask for funding. There was no money. It was not seen as academically. So they were not going to fund me. I thought, heck, I'm going to start my own. I'll use my own money to, to develop a curriculum. <clears throat> so I made a CD, CD-ROM. And I good thing I have lots of nieces and nephews who are hockey players. And I went back to my home community. And I told them this is what I was going to do. And my... Um, Two nephews that I raised, uh, I asked them to help me because they were, uh, what do you call it? They were coaches and they were also uh, referees. <clears throat> so they knew a lot about hockey. Well, I was a hockey aunt. So I asked them if they could help me. So we did that. So we gathered uh, all our nieces and nephews and I said, we need about uh, 18 people, 18. So pick the best ones that, uh, you know, and then we'll train them. So we rented the hockey rink. And I went to my girlfriend first in Wapool Island. So we looked at the themes. You know, we started off, uh, what is hockey? Where do they play hockey? In the arena. What kind of arenas are there? What colors are they? Are they round? Are they square? Whatever. So you're teaching all of these things. The contents in the arena. Equipment, what they need. Rules of hockey. If you're going to play a good play of hockey, you need a good nutrition. And then uh, uh, refereeing also, and the clothing that they wear. And also at the end is the role models. There wasn't very many uh, NHL role models that were in a schnobbeck, but I found one that was from Six Nations. Um, <clears throat> and uh, oh, Nolan, Ted Nolan was one also from Ojibwe side. So I asked those people if they knew they were either the uh, Schnabek, you know, that could help me with this to be as role models. And so we picked, because we ran out because there wasn't too many, too many NHL hockey players. So we chose uh, junior players, you know, that, uh, that could play hockey. So I had to develop a hockey CD round for them and it was, fun to do it. It was so much fun. Uh, the only thing that I came uh, hard across was uh, 
there was no word for uh, protection, you know, for your private parts. Um, what do you call that now? Jockstrap. So <clears throat> I had a really difficult time. But I, you know, I had to learn how to research. So I went to many of the elders when I looked for men, older men that were fluent speakers to that played hockey and all of these things to Australian men that would know the language also. So those were important for me to, to go to. And so, because I was a woman and asking them, how do you say jockstrap? Or if there was a word for it, they would look at me very funny. They had a twinkle in their eye and they would say, what good of you do you want to know that word? <laughs> I had to explain all what I was doing. And they came up with the word. He says, one, he says, I don't think they had it. And then the other one was, uh, I think they had put moss inside them to protect them. Uh, and I said, why was it important to protect that? He says, well, you know, if you got injured, um, you wouldn't be able to have children. So that's why it was very important to have moss to protect yourself. So I thought that was really good to learn. Then I learned about uh, hockey association. In Okamakong, we were not allowed to play in a hockey league because we were Anishinaabek, we were Indians. We were not allowed to play. This is 1950. They were very smart, so they went to Killarney. In Killarney, there were Métis people there. So they asked them to, if they could be part of it. And that's uh, what they did is they, the Métis people were ready to jump. And so they're the ones that started the league along with the Anishinaabek. And they won their first hockey uh, tournament uh, in the league in 1950. So it's been a joy learning the language and investigating, learning new ways how to go about it. And it's a joy. And I started to tell you about the Anishinaabemowin Tech, which we gather to, uh, to learn about uh, language issues. Well, I was coming out one time after the language conference, and I was sort of eavesdropping. These ladies were talking about uh, what they heard. And so they said, oh, so I, I thought about that. It means I am full of grace. So I thought it, it gave them something when they were hearing the language. It gave them something very whole in their hearts, and they were fulfilled coming out from the conference. So, so that's a kind of a healing and joy of teaching the language or revitalizing the language because the language was given to us by the Creator, and we need to take care of it. So I'll say that much. Thank you so much for sharing all of that all of that with us, Shirley. It was really lovely to hear and kind of, you know, I think it's so important to, if the kids are interesting and interested in learning the language specifically tied to hockey, why not teach them that, right? Um, Sarah or, yeah, Sarah or Lacey, I'm wondering if you have anything else to kind of add to this. Did you have anything you wanted to say, Lacey? You, or do you want to go for it? <laughs> oh, um, I was just thinking about specifically, I think from the last conversation uh, and questions that you had too, is that like language is kind of infectious. And especially because I see it in art, it makes me really happy to know that like, you know, JT Arcan's work is like so cool. Like when I first started seeing it, I was like, oh my, like, you know, these like bright lights, like, you don't you just don't see the language like that and I think that's like why I love seeing it in art and I think it's so important to just have that like <clears throat> the conversation even between like different languages of like understanding you seeing how that that's how their words are translated into English and then kind of thinking about like oh well, how would I do that or like how would I be cheeky in my language and like you know, like, I really like that kind of thing where it's like, uh, we have our own senses of humors and then, yeah, it kind of crosses 
language barriers as well. And I think that's why it's so exciting. But yeah, specifically, yeah, that's what keeps me, that's what keeps me going when it comes to language. No, thank you for that. Yeah, I think I really resonate with that. Yeah, kind of bringing a bit of the humor into the language. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Sarah, do you have anything? Um, well, I, when uh, Shirley mentioned um, what that lady said, um, or what she overheard her saying coming uh, from the Nishna Bamwente conference, it reminded me of, um, is like the uh, feeling that I had um, that speaks to how the learning um, Anishinaabe one can be, or any indigenous language can be a healing process. Um, I had uh, my first uh, immersion learning experience back in 2017. I attended a two week immersion camp in Chiging and uh, it was total immersion. There was no English whatsoever. So it was actually really hard. I struggled and uh, I, I wanted to leave actually. I got all the way out there. I was like, oh gosh, it's not for me. But I had driven so far that I couldn't go back. So <laughs> I stayed. And uh, But at, anyway, so at the end of the two weeks, um, we had uh, a pipe ceremony to end the camp uh, to conclude it. And uh, Anyway, it was just, it was really nice. I was listening to the, the pipe carrier. He was uh, talking and like any, everything else in the camp um, that had happened, he spoke only in Nishnabemwin. Uh, he didn't use any English. And uh, for, even though I couldn't understand like everything that he was saying, I couldn't understand some of it. And because I had been immersed in Nishnabemwin you know, for so many hours up to that point, I didn't have those like internal walls or blocks up where you are struggling to understand everything and trying like, yeah, I just, I just let it, you know, I just listened and, and let it flow through me. And it was, uh, it was really nice. And like, there's things, there's knowledge that came to me, you know, during that ceremony that I don't know where it came from. It's just, you know, popped up in my mind. And uh, it's like, uh, like when you're meditating, you're supposed to like wait for, you know, these thoughts to enter your mind. Um, I'm terrible at meditating. And uh, anyway, it was the only time where I just had this clear mind and, you know, teachings and, uh, and, they, and they were healing. There were things that I needed to know, like at that time. And uh, so I don't know how the language connected me to that specifically, but it just, it helped to create this space where I was able to, to have some healing and, and some knowledge and self-learning. So it was really nice. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's a good motivation for learning the indigenous language. It will help you learn the secrets of the universe. <laughs> no, thank you for that, Sarah. I think, yeah, for myself, I would really love to go to kind of an immersion camp for either Machif or in a So that sounds like a really lovely experience that you had. Um, we do have our next question actually comes from the chat. Uh, so it is, do any of you have advice for folks hoping to start learning their language? Where is the best place to start? Anyone can kind of speak up whenever they have uh, anything to say on that. My family keeps tagging me on Facebook that there's like free online classes. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's like Mohawk and Kyuga I saw one recently and um, I've been using the apps on um, the Apple store. There's like a really good one for Mohawk um, that I found and even like Oneida and Kyuga. I don't think I saw an Onondaga one, but even that, like just listening to hear the words, I think is really important. Um, but yeah, those classes. Sometimes you can catch a free class. It's really awesome. Yeah, there's uh, today, you know, we have a good technology. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people contributing to, uh, to the language. There's, uh, you know, immersion programs uh, now with the colleges and universities. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we are learning also how to read and write. So one of the most important things to do is to learn the orthography so that you're able to read and to write after. 
uh, <clears throat> that's an important thing. Also, one of the joyous ways of uh, one of the one of the things is the the joy of bringing the language is you receive uh, grace yourself. You are really contributing to uh, a good mental health. You're bringing healing to the individuals of healing the minds of your people. Uh, that's what the language has, brings us. It's also very funny uh, when I was doing lots of researching on the, on the thematic uh, language that a book that I did was that uh, we ran into a lot of homonym words, words that uh, mean the same, the words that write the same or sound the same, <clears throat> but they have two different meanings. Uh, I'll give you an example. One is Mishito Nagan. Mishito Nagan means uh, uh, must a beard, people that have a beard. Um, but if we say it slowly, slowly, Mish Donagan, that means give her her plate. So you really have to watch out what you're saying when you're using when you're using those words. Um, so I found a lot of. Uh, I did a workshop for his Dr. Lewis on homonyms also, and I'm still doing a lot of homonyms, and I I have a lot of words that I have put away. So actually, it's really fun also to write the um, a play in the language because you are describing what the scene is about. You're describing that because one of the things that the uh, uh people love is the drama or skits or and uh, things like that. So even though if you don't understand, you could see what the idea is, what the person is doing. So. Uh, that's uh, like supporting art, what you're seeing, and a play in the language is uh, also very important. Uh, it's funny, it's very interesting also, uh, uh, as you're developing uh, the language. And, and so for me, it brings me joy. It also gives me a great contentment uh, to be able to contribute to something uh, before I leave this world. The, the years are going faster and faster. And uh, I pray that I, I'm in good health to be able to still read and write uh, the language in many different ways. I've uh, developed a lot of language materials so far. This one is the, the latest. It's called Sholi. The picture is what I'm trying to get. Uh, I had my girlfriend write, I just told her my story. My story was when I was a child. And so I asked her, I told a story and she grasped what I was saying. So it's my father and I used to go fishing. So there's a boat right there. And, and this is where he taught me a lot of good things. He taught me the culture while we we're out on the land about the land, water, trees, the sounds, and of listening also. That's where I got that, so that's where I wrote. So I used that picture to, to write the book, which he called Shuli. Uh, my brother didn't go to school, the oldest brother. There are no R's in our language, so that's why he always called me Shuli. You couldn't say Shirley, so I call it uh, Shuli, my early years. And it, it's, um, it's about stories about hunting, gathering, fishing, trapping, all of those experiences that I had. And of course, in there, things that we did, how we used to uh, uh, get water and we make fun of it, uh, have fun in getting uh, the water because we had to get the water from the lake. And so we had, there was nine of us. So we, there was, uh, what do you call that? Uh, chain, water chain. So you get the pail, you fill it, and it goes down the line. And then we had a competition. Where was the slowest? We'll get it at the end. Where was the fastest? We'll get a prize. <laughs> it's usually a candy or something. <laughs> but we have fun 
doing the work, but at the same time, finding ways how to be productive to help your mother and father. Maybe. Thank you for that, uh, Shirley. Uh, Sarah, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for folks looking to learn the language? Uh, yeah, just a couple of short ones. Um, I think it's important to understand first, like yourself and what kind of learner are you and what kind of person are you? And then that will help you because um, I think immersion programs are incredibly effective. But, uh, you know, if you're kind of shy and you're introverted, that's okay. But you might not want to jump in right away and you don't want to feel defeated. So, yeah, just understanding yourself first and then going from there. Um, I read a book. I haven't read the whole book. I've read some of it, but it's called uh, Fluent Forever. And uh, it's a pretty famous, like, accelerated language learning book. Um, but, yeah, look it up. And... Uh, it's a really good step-by-step -step guide to learning any language quickly. Um, and it's based on neuroscience. So it's, you know, research proven methods, but basically, um, you know, it's just the first step really is learning the sounds of whatever language it is you're learning, whether it is you know, Mohawk or Anishinaabemowin, um, getting those sounds down first so not even learning words don't worry about dictionaries or anything like that just listen to the sounds and and, and learn that and then move on to words and then sentences and grammar and you know all that jazz and uh, so if you don't have access to a speaker who can help you understand those sounds um, a lot of those online dictionaries now for Anishinaabemowin anyway um, have audio attached to the the entries so yeah just listening to the language is really good for step. Thank you for that hot tip on that book, Ruin Forever. I'm definitely going to try and find it and pick it up because um, that sounds like a really interesting way to kind of start the journey. Um, and just to answer this question myself, um, I'm originally from Edmonton and I've been living in Calgary for the past, I was living in Calgary for a few years. Both the Edmonton Public Library and the Cal Calgary Public Library have offer language courses, uh, Indigenous language courses. So my suggestion for folks would be to check out your local library to see if they offer any sort of resources like that. Um, or I've also seen some friendship centers in different cities offer languages as well. That might be also a good place to kind of reach out to folks. And that way you're also with more community members as well. Um, so I we do have about 10, 13 minutes left. So I just want to make one last call for any sort of audience questions. If you have anything burning that you want to ask, uh, just pop it into either the Q&A box or the chat to the right. Um, with that, my next question is for Lacey. So this is a pretty big question. There's no right answer. And I think everybody's going to have a different opinion on this, but I think I'm wondering from your perspective as an artist, do you think that art can support Indigenous language vitalization efforts? And like, is there a place for art in those efforts? Uh, I was thinking about this a lot lately, especially since I moved back and I'm trying to be, teach myself. Um, but like, definitely, because um, I've been coming around and seeing more stuff around like, community-wise it's like that's you know that's what all the schools need they need artists to like be able to make booklets and stuff but even like I don't I don't like that they kind of think of them as like two separate things often like um I guess like gallery artists versus like illustrator and all these things like cause there, it seems like there's a bit of like a kind of separation in how we think of them and I've been thinking about that a lot lately and how like, I don't know, just like artists on the reserve are kind of thought differently if they kind of stay here versus like someone like me who moved to the city and went to art school. And I kind of want to, yeah, I just want things to be more holistic in how we see like artists functioning in um cultural spaces because we're all it's all cultural right like um yeah and 
yeah, just how I've been able to see things since I've been learning my language again and like brushing up on it has like helped me a lot because, you know, I want to do everything, whether it's like connecting people like to make art and do things or like, you know, organizing. Um, I think that's kind of where I want to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think, you know, this hierarchy of artists, you know, needs to it's like very colonial minded um, way to think about art, you know, that someone who is self-taught and works with community versus someone who went to art school and is presenting working galleries is somehow above those community artists or just folks that do art for themselves. And I think, yeah, this hierarchy of artists is, should be gotten rid of to say it nicely. <laughs> um, so my next question, question uh, is for all of you. I'm wondering if there is something you want people to know about your ancestral language, some like a fun fact or your favorite word, just something uh, like a takeaway for folks here that they should know. Um, I guess I've if I had to tell somebody one thing about Mishnah Bemwin uh, that I would want them to know if they didn't know anything is that it's a very descriptive language. And, uh, you know, so a single word, um, you know, when it's broken down, it like it paints a whole picture in your mind of, of what's happening. So I guess, yeah, there's kind of a connection to art there. Um, but yeah, I really, yeah, but I think that's the goal of a speaker in Anishinaab Bemwin is to create this image in the mind of the person they're speaking to of what they're talking about. And so very descriptive and lots of little pieces in there. Um, and uh, yeah, I was I was looking up words this morning for snow and there are lots of words to describe the snow in Anishinaab Bemwin and the wind and all those natural elements. And so the word that I came across that I immediately had the image in my mind um, was anyway, but it's um, uh, hearing somebody coming through the running through the snow. So they're running towards you. And uh, anyway, but yeah, so be this to approach and where where is like the audible part of the approaching uh, you know, coming through the snow and the it comes from mipto uh, is to run. So yeah, it's just super interesting. Thank you. Um, Lacey or Shirley? Oh, I guess see Shirley's unmuting. Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> you know, um, I go to what they call the Longhouse, but with ours is uh, Medewin um, Lodge. Uh, the word Medewin means the good sounding lodge. Men, men means good, they means hard. Lewin is the way it is. So when you put those three to get words, syllabuses together, it means the good hearted way. We are looking for to find a good hearted way of life, how to be good in life. We are born with goodness, but if we want to be better uh, to do things as part of the mission of the creator. So, um, <clears throat> so the other day we were practicing singing because we have to sing in a lodge. Also, the word bidwewashe, bidwewashe means um, <clears throat> the, uh, we're, think, we're talking, we're thinking about the magus. So in our lodge, when we dance, we have a magus that are going to be given to in a shed. So bidwewashe magus is, uh, is that uh, you're dancing that magus this way. It means you're bringing the sound of that magus and bringing in the sound of something to you because you're the one that's accepting accepting that. And the other person who is going to be initiated has their hands out like that so that uh, the energy comes this way. So we have lots of words like that, like I just described, Medewin, 
and Pedro uh, Ache, the song that we sing, and the uh, <clears throat> a lot of the things uh, uh, fulfills the idea what life is about, and uh, it is important that we learn. Uh, we keep the language because it is said that in our philosophy of life that when we leave this world, the creator is going to ask us, He's going to ask you in your own language, what is your name? Who's your clan? And that you are going to be so happy to dance that you're going to dance in the Milky Way as you go up to the sky world. So there's a lot of things like that uh, in our language because part of language and culture, language only describes the ideas of what we're encountering. Uh, the culture is the way we live. And so it describes all of that. So miigwech. And I got to leave, so I'm going to say, it's a bit of pleasure to be with you guys. So I'm going to log out because I got to log into the other one. So. Yes. Thank you so much, Shirley. It was really nice meeting uh -huh. you and good luck on your next panel that you have this afternoon. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, um, Lacey, I'm wondering if you have anything that you want to share about Mohawk to folks, your favorite word, kind of. Um, well, I was thinking about, like, while Shirley was talking, <laughs> that it's, like, <clears throat> really important to connect with elders if you can, because, like, I was so lucky to have my great aunt, Uncle Loft Goha, as, like, my first language teacher, and, like, she was fluent in the same way that Shirley was, I guess. And like how rare that is, like if you know someone like that, like because all the stories they tell are like so important and you'll always remember them. And like whenever I remember Mohawk or I'm like remembering to speak Mohawk, like I can still hear her voice because I was so, I guess I was so young, but like, you know, it's like that really has a huge impact when you're with somebody like that. Um, and I think that was the biggest thing I've been learning for myself is that like, even though I was gone and I had the capability of becoming fluent, um, like I didn't really think about it too much because, you know, I went to high school and kind of just was like, I don't know, that's Mohawk and you don't really think too much of it. And then once you're gone and you know all these people that like, they didn't have that and you're just like, wow, like, did I take this for granted? But for me, it's more like finding a place within where I'm at to like um, help fill in the gaps because there are younger people learning now and like the revitalization is happening, like whether you see it or not. And I'm glad that I see it coming from a language background. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. I really appreciate you sharing. Um, with that being said, there's no more chats. There's no more questions in the chat. Our time is running out. And yeah, so say I just want to so I think we're just going to end on that note. Thank you again so much to the two of you for joining us today. Um, and kind of having this conversation. It was really lovely to speak to the two of you. I just want to also say thank you to the Robert McLaughlin Gallery for hosting these conversations as well as the uh, exhibition and Mama No Pegasquivina project. Um, super excited to, for the next step with that. Um, we do have one more bit of programming, uh, public programming for like the winter snow kills the grass, the summer sun revives it. On March 5th, there will be another online conversation with myself and an artist from the exhibition, Susan Blight. Um, registration for that can either be found on the RMG's website or Truck's website as well. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for taking the time to meet with us today.